want to introduce our next speaker. Jeff Katash is a managing director of FSG, a nonprofit consulting firm specializing in strategy, evaluation, and research. Founded in 2000 as Foundation Strategy Group, FSG has had more than a decade of global social impact. At FSG, Jeff leads the San Francisco office and the firm's education and youth practice. He has led engagements with foundations, nonprofits, universities, school districts, state agencies, and corporations on issues of strategy, evaluation, business planning, and advocacy. Jeff's work in education spans from early childhood to higher education, the cradle to career pipeline. With recent projects focused on systems alignment, closing the achievement and attainment gaps, and strengthening teacher and school leadership. Jeff speaks regularly at education, on education issues, as well as philanthropic effectiveness. We are definitely in for a stimulating conversation today. It is my pleasure, and can you please welcome to the stage, Jeff Katash. Hi there, uh, it, is, it is great to be here. And I, was, uh, I woke up this morning, and the first thing I did is I called my wife, and she said, oh, what are you doing? And I said, I'm preparing for my talk. And the first thing she asked was whether I had gotten my haircut. <laughs> and I told her, no, I got in late last night. I don't think I'm going to have time. I need to get ready for the talk. And she said, no, I saw what you looked like when you left. You have to go get your haircut. So I did. Thankfully, there is a haircutting place right in the hotel. And I just want to say that for any of you who see me throughout the rest of the day or tomorrow, if this talk, even if it goes terribly, at least tell me my haircut looks good. <laughs> um, but I want to start actually with a, a, another story about my daughter. And she turned six this weekend. And we were um, in a restaurant last week, out at dinner, a crowded restaurant, set the table for you. Small, small restaurant, lots of tables close together. And she announces in that loud voice that little kids have. You know that like loud voice that reaches the back of Carnegie Hall or Yankee Stadium, just penetrating voice. She says, I've decided what I want for my birthday. I want a baby, but not a baby doll. I want a real baby that I can take care of. So you and that mom, you and dad need to go home and do the special hug that makes babies for me. <laughs> this wave of laughter ripples out into the restaurant. Tables are laughing, I'm laughing, my wife has turned completely red. And you know what, as soon as it kind of calms down, we told Thea, we said, you know, sorry, you're six, you can't take care of the baby yet. And if we have another baby, it'll be our baby, it'll be your sister, and there's a lot you can do to help. And she is, I mean, remarkable for, for at the time, a five-year-old, now a six-year-old, remarkably independent and capable. I mean, this is a child who, at two and a half, started changing her own diaper. She, she changed her own diaper, like a self-cleaning oven. It was really, it was <laughs> remarkable to me. And ironically, we, we got home that night, and my wife and I were watching Comedy Central, and there was a comedian on who's, who had four kids. And I promise I will get to Collective Impact and Catalytic Philanthropy, but put me on a mic and I just start talking. Um, but this comedian said he had four kids, and he often gets asked to describe, what is it like to have four children? And he says, this is the way I describe it. Imagine you're drowning, and someone hands you a baby. And it struck with me, because he was saying it kind of as a joking way, but I think on a lot of the issues that you're working on, and when I think of the lives that a lot of women are living in the world, that is exactly describes the circumstance they're in. Imagine you're drowning and someone hands you a baby. And I even take that to the philanthropic sector, and I started thinking about it. If you ask a lot of foundation executives, or you ask nonprofit leaders, or you ask folks working on the ground delivering health care or education or economic empowerment, in this, in this world where we have of incredibly growing needs combined with diminishing resources, and you ask them, what is it like to do your job right now? It just wouldn't surprise me if they said the exact same thing. It feels like I'm drowning and someone just handed me a baby. And it gets me to what I want to talk about today. Um, I'm going to talk about a couple things today. Whoops, I hit this thing that goes blank. Try that again. Um, the first is around catalytic philanthropy. And, um, you know, FSG, our firm, we've been around for 10 years, and our roots are in serving the, the philanthropic community with a strong belief that funders have a unique role 
to play in driving social change and an incredible ability to do so with the flexibility of their dollars, the innovative approaches that they can, that they can put forward. But as a sector, we felt they have, there was a long way to go to make them more effective in their practice. And that's where the kind of ideas around catalytic philanthropy and how funders make significant change uh, you know, in the world. And then the second topic we'll talk about today a little bit is moving from that to the idea of, of collective impact, which when you, move, when you rise above the idea of a single funder or a single nonprofit, um, to get to the idea of how multiple actors work together in aligned fashion to create significant change and how to, how to do that. And then lastly, I'll make sure we leave some time for questions and responses. And I'm very, very particular about the word responses because some of the ideas we're going to talk about today are really emerging. They're very new. There are some good promising practices and early examples, a few longer seated efforts in the topic that are, that are yielding great and dramatic results. But still, I feel like we don't yet have all the answers. So while we, well, I, I can't guarantee you answers, I can at least guarantee you responses. Um, so let's just jump in. And I want to start with, with what um, you know, at FSU we viewed as a very unusual story of a funder driving change. I don't know if you've heard of the Meth Project in, in Montana. Uh, but Tom Siebel, who started Siebel Systems, while you know, the company is based up in, in, a, you know, in the Bay Area, in my neck of the woods, um, is a native of Montana. And back in 2005, he learned that in his home state, had the fifth highest rate of meth abuse in the country. And that 50% of the inmates in Montana's uh, facilities were there for meth-related crime. And that at a direct cost for the state, about $100, uh, $100 million worth of cost directly to the state. And then, I mean, the, the worst part about it is just the, the, the family tragedies and the individual loss and the, the catastrophic impact that that drug has on, on individuals and, and the people around them. And he decided he had to do something about it. So he spent a lot of time looking, and he looked at the, the nonprofits that were working on the topic. He looked at the funders who were putting dollars into it. He looked at the agencies, county and state, that were trying to do something about it. And it just didn't speak to him. It just didn't feel that that kind of an approach was going to get where he wanted to go. And he wanted dramatic change. He didn't want them to go from fifth highest rates you know, to tenth highest rates. He wanted to really change this as an issue. And the research kind of pointed out to him that the entry point for this was first-time use that if you could prevent first-time use, you, your rates could drop pretty dramatically. And what he did is, and for a, founder, for a funder, I mean, really quite different approach, didn't make a single grant. He hired an ad agency. Um, he hired like a major ad agency, and they developed this series of incredibly hard-hitting commercials. I don't know if anyone has ever seen them, but they are online if you want. I mean, they're harrowing. They're gut-wrenching. They hit you. Like some of them hit you right in the gut, some hit you right in the heart. Powerful stuff. And he said he wanted every teenager in the state to see some message from this campaign three times a week. And 45,000 TV ads later, 35,000 radio ads, 1,000 billboards, over two years, meth, rate, meth use dropped 45% in the state, and meth-related crime dropped 60%. Significant change. And the price tag, $7 million. I mean, it's really remarkable. It's, to me, it's a remarkable story, both for the vision to try something very, very different and not go down the typical path that most funders would go down of thinking, I, well, there's, I give money and I give it to nonprofits and they do the work. He took ownership over that as an issue and did something very different to solve that problem. Um, and I'll, boy, I keep doing that again. And I want to take that back and pull it back to the sector. Because at the time when we were doing a lot of looking at the philanthropic sector, what we really noticed was that over the 25 years leading up to when Tom Siebel was doing this work, giving in the U.S. had gone up by about 250%. About $300 billion plus a year was going from funders to the nonprofit community. And yet, in the US, every single major measure of, of, of social progress was in decline versus our, our, our peers in OECD. Every single one, education, healthcare, across the board. So what was happening with all this funding? Why wasn't it resulting in the outcomes that we hoped to see? Why wasn't it moving the needle on these major issues? And it really, two things kind of jumped out at us. One was that there was a lack of coherent strategy behind the funding. And the second was that it relied heavily and almost exclusively in some ways um, you know, on nonprofits, which are wonderful organizations doing incredibly great work, but are resource constrained, um, are incredibly fragmented. They lack coordination and accountability. Um, I think at last check of the 1.5 billion nonprofit, 1.5 million nonprofits we have in the US, 90% of them have budgets under half a million dollars. Um, and that led us to a set of thinking. We said, okay, well, maybe it could be different. Where are cases where funders, in the way that they've worked, have led to really 
significant change on a social issue. And what did they do? And we went around and spent about, probably about seven or eight months looking around the country and in fact around the world at looking for exactly those examples. And then looked across them and said, all right, what do they have in common? And to us, it came up with these four practices really emerged out of it. And I'll talk a little bit about them and, and give an example and, and then I'll, I'll move it from individual funders up to kind of collective action. Uh, the first was that they took responsibility for achieving results. They set a measurable goal, not for their grantees, but for themselves and the change they wanted to create. Um, you know, and then they owned the problem. They held themselves accountable for solving, for solving that problem. Um, you know, and I think a, a great example of this is uh, the Rockdale Foundation, which we, which we wrote about as a case study when we wrote about catalytic philanthropy. A very small family foundation where the family members who were on a trip to Cuba saw some microfinance at play and saw the difference it was making in people's lives. And they were from a Middle Eastern descent and they had not heard anything about microfinance. And they started looking at the difference it was making in people's lives in Africa and in Southeast Asia and Latin America and asked the question, why isn't there microfinance in the Middle East? And then when they looked into it, they learned an awful lot about it and they said, this is what we're going to hold ourselves accountable for. We're gonna create microfinance in the Middle East. I mean, that's pretty daunting. And they did a few things over a couple of years. And there, it's not a lot of grant making they did. What they did is they translated all of the microfinance literature into Arabic because none of it appeared in Arabic. They held the first ever conference in the Middle East on microfinance. There was one organization in the Middle East at the time who was making microfinance grants, had one staff member and incredibly low capacity. They invested in that organization and built its capacity. And at the same time, they used their platform as, as individuals of high wealth running a foundation to go and talk to their peers all around the world who were doing microfinance about what was happening. And over the first seven years that they did this work, the number of microfinance loans in the Middle East jumped from 40,000 to 3 million. And their investment, $400,000. It's, it's just an amazing story. Um, the second thing we found that, that the really significant efforts did is that they viewed their efforts as campaigns for change. Um, and I think a lot of this thinking is uh, Wesley Crutchfeld, if any of you have read her book, around, Do More Than Good, around the seven habits of highly effective nonprofits, is something that she really points to as well. And you know, we, we're talking about this in the funder setting, but I think any organization, nonprofit, state, gov even a government agency sometimes, um, Non, uh, funders can lead these campaigns for change where you realize a problem is so big that you have to engage others in order to solve it. Um, you know, and I think of uh, Emily Tao Jackson at the Tao Foundation, a small foundation in Connecticut, invested a relatively modest amount of money to pull together state level players, county level players, city level players, public and private organizations around creating a statewide plan to change their juvenile justice system and resulted in complete system change in that state. And again, for an investment that was less than $500,000. The third, and I think this is a place where the philanthropic sector has grown considerably in the last couple of years, is using all of the available tools. So yes, grant making. At its heart, foundations need to and should be making great, thoughtful grants to, to strong organizations. But foundations and funders have so many other resources at their disposal. Ability to, to, to do advocacy, and ability to get the, vo the voice of the business community, and ability to do loans and, and mission investing, and ability to generate lawsuits when they're needed, um, and ability to use the media like Tom Siebel did. And that when they moved beyond the idea of thinking about just being grant makers, and toward the idea of how do I actually employ all of the assets that I have available, they tended to make an awful lot more progress. And I think...